All right, this is class number two of our CSE 104. And hopefully, if we can hurry, we'll try to get everything done in the next uh, nine weeks and the next nine classes and talk, finish up what's on our seminar part six and our seminar part seven. Okay, we told you last week some of the, we reviewed some science, okay, about the Meisner effect and about the um, super cold temperatures in outer space and throwing a snowball too fast, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to give you the Hovind theory of what I think happened. This is not all original with me, nothing's original with me. But I've put together bits and pieces that I've gleaned from various places that uh, I think make sense about what might have caused the freezing of the mammoths, the tilt of the earth, the beginning of the seasons, the cracking of the crust of the earth, all these things that apparently happened at the time of the flood. Here we go. I'm gonna, well, first I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. That's supposed to be a good teaching technique, okay? Uh, so I'm going to go through real fast first, eight points I want to cover, and then we'll go through and talk about each point. Number one, I think Noah and the animals got safely into the ark. God shut the door. Number two, a 300 de degree below zero ice meteor in spaces full of ice comets came flying through the solar system and began to break apart. As it broke apart, some of the fragments got caught and became the rings around other planets. Saturn, Venus, or Saturn, Uranus, and uh, uh, Neptune have rings around them, ice rings. We'll get into that in a minute. And some of the fragments hit the planets and caused craters like the moon. And some of the fragments hit the Earth and landed on the North and South Pole, freezing the mammoths. Point three, as it approached the Earth, it shattered in space. Super cold snow and ice rained down around the poles, mostly around the North and South Pole. Then this sudden dump of ice caused the Earth's crust to crack, which released the fountains of the deep. The rapid spreading of the ice caused all the ice age effects, carved out the Great Lakes, made all the uh, drumlins and terminal moraines, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It buried the mammoths in super cold snow, three to four hundred below zero, so they suffocated, standing up, and froze in three to five hours. It was so cold. It caused the Earth to wobble for the next few thousand years, and it made the canopy that used to protect the Earth collapse, because cold air hits warm air, rains, all the rain came down, the canopy's no longer up there. We're not protected like they were before the flood, and the Earth was completely covered by water. Then, during the first few months of the flood, the dead animals settled out and were buried. Those became fossils. Swirling waters deposited great piles of dead plants and animals, and they became coal and fossil graveyards over the next few hundred years. During the last few months of the flood, the unstable plates of the fractured earth shifted, moved around. Pieces lifted up, other places sank down. Thin spots would sink down, and the water would rush in, filling it in to make an ocean. The places where it lifted up would become the mountain ranges. On the way from the top to the bottom, it's going to wipe out a lot of canyons, or wash out a lot of canyons in a hurry. So canyons were eroded because the sediment was still fairly soft after the first few hundred years after the flood. Over the next few hundred years, the ice caps generally retreated from Kansas City clear back to where they are now in Alaska. This would add water to the ocean, making the oceans colder, deeper, and wider, which is why we have a continental shelf, which we'll get into in a minute. Cold water absorbed carbon dioxide, and lifespans were shortened in the days of Peleg because of the lack of greenhouse gases, which allowed more radiation in, and numerous factors probably entered in here, but the days were, lifespans were shortened in the days of Peleg. Lastly, the earth still shows the effects of this devastating flood as a reminder of God's hatred for sin. Okay, start at the beginning now. I told you what I was going to tell you, now I'm going to tell you. Noah and his family got into the ark. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou. Now there's an awesome sermon right here. God didn't say, Go into the ark. He said, come into the ark. So where does God have to be in order to say that? In the ark. Now that'll preach, okay? There's a sermon in there somewhere. Somebody ought to find that one, okay? I don't mind going on a year-long cruise with a bunch of animals if the Lord's in there with me. The Lord said, come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast shalt thou take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of every, the beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Now there's always been some interesting questions about this verse, because what was clean and unclean was not really revealed until Moses, in about a thousand years after this flood. At least that's when Moses wrote the book of Leviticus and said certain animals are clean, you know, it has to have a split hoof and chew the cud and all that kind of stuff. Apparently, it was always common knowledge what was clean and un unclean, because Noah apparently knew. Maybe this is something God told to Adam, but it simply wasn't recorded in the Bible until this time, until Leviticus. We don't know. 
But this is a question of, you know, how did Noah know what's clean and clean, unclean? It just may have been common knowledge. Why did he take seven of some? Well, there have been a lot of speculation on this. The Bible does not tell us, okay? But let me give you some of the, uh, the theories of why this, he may have taken seven. After the flood, of course, they're going to have to have something for sacrifice. If you only have two of each kind and you sacrifice one of them, you now have a problem getting that species to keep going, right? Uh, that may be one reason. Another reason, he might, when it says he took seven, it doesn't say if it's seven pairs or just seven animals. And people have argued, was it seven pairs or just seven animals? I don't know. I don't see where the Bible gives us enough uh, to be clear on that either. It says, take them by sevens, the male and his female. Some people have argued that he took one male and six female, like farmers do with their cows. You have one bull uh, or you know, one deer, uh, have six female deer and one uh, male deer. Uh, well, that's typically what happens in nature. Okay? One, one has his harem or his herd. And that may be, you get a lot of genetic variety that way in a hurry. With one bull and six cows, you can get a uh, genetic variation pretty quick, and that may be what he did. Uh, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say, so I had to just leave it at that. If you figure it out, let me know, please. Okay? Genesis 8, uh, 15. God said unto Noah, spake unto Noah, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons, thy sons' wives with thee. This is when they went out of the ark. Uh, so back in Genesis chapter 7, they went in. First God said, Come into the ark, and then he said, Go forth. The Lord was in the ark with him. Or he would have said, come out of the ark, Noah. No, he said, go out of the ark, Noah. That'll preach, okay? And they that went in, went in male and female and all flesh, as the God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now, he only had to bring those in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and only those on dry land. No fish, no insects were required to go. Some probably did. You know, how would you keep them out? Hopefully no termites, but... Um, of course, the ark was coated inside and out with pitch, so maybe it wouldn't have been a problem. The uh, Lord shut him in. Now, this is an interesting, God shut the door. This is a good eternal security verse. If God shuts the door, it won't leak. People say, do you think you're going to heaven no matter what you do? <coughs> oh, yeah. It would be impossible for me to go to hell because God promised if, I, whoso, if you have the Son, you have eternal life. He doesn't say you will get eternal life. He says you have eternal life. So if you could lose it, then you have temporary life. You don't have eternal life. <laughs> I don't see how you can possibly lose something. If you, get, if you have eternal life and you lost it, then it wasn't eternal. So you didn't have it. And we can go on all day on that topic. Churches split over, over that question right there, you know, eternal security. But anybody who reads their Bible long enough eventually comes to the conclusion that, you know, the Baptists are right. Okay. Um, <coughs> Second thing that happened, a 300 degree below zero Fahrenheit uh, meteor, this is Menmohoven theory, came plowing through space and cratered the moon and the planets and made some rings around some of the other planets. Some planets have ice rings around them. Mercury has a lot of craters. It looks like something hit, made a hole, but we don't know what hit. Nobody sees the moon, for instance, get hit by anything. And yet the moon has lots of huge craters in it. What happened? If a chunk of ice hit it, it would make the crater <coughs> and then melt away. See, the moon has very little gravity and no atmosphere. And it turns so slowly, it takes about 29 days to turn one time. It also happens to go around the Earth in 29 days, so we always see the same side. But because the moon is turning so slowly and there's no atmosphere to insulate it, it gets extremely hot on the daylight side, about 250 degrees. So if a chunk of ice hit, it would vaporize. Now on the dark side, it would stay frozen, but you know, within a month, it'd be gone. So some have argued that maybe ice is what made the craters on the moon. I don't know. Uh, a chunk of ice certainly would do that and leave those features behind. Several planets, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, have ice rings around them. Why? Nobody knows where it's from or why it's this way. But they have these rings around it. Saturn's rings, of course, are famous, and you can see them with a telescope from here. You know, we were out the other night looking at Saturn's rings. Just unbelievable. But uh, these rings are made of ice and rock, but lots of them are just plain chunks of ice floating around. Where did they come from? One theory is it came from this ice meteor. Okay, point number three. As this ice meteor approached the Earth, <coughs> or fragments of it, it shattered in space 
just like throwing a snowball too fast. It blew apart in space and it ended up with a shotgun effect coming down as a zillion pieces of super cold uh, ice crystals. Some people have argued, oh, now you can't have an ice meteor and come through the Earth because the Earth has an atmosphere and it'll melt it. I understand all that, okay? If the pre-flood world had a canopy of water above the atmosphere and squeezed it down to maybe 20 miles of atmosphere, today we have 100 miles. Let's just pick a number. Say it was 20 miles thick or 10 miles thick. Adam wouldn't care. I mean, 10 miles is, you, you wouldn't bump your head on it, okay? Uh, it would double the air pressure. Plus, an ice meteor now, if fragments are coming through, sure, a lot of them get vaporized, not only from the temperature, but from the friction, you know, just building up friction. But just like you can spray a hose right through the middle of a fire, you get a stream of water going right through a fire, some of it makes it right on through. Some of it gets vaporized, you know, but some of it makes it through. You get enough going in one direction, you get a cold channel through the middle of a hot fire, and you can actually spray a hose right through a bonfire. I think you could do the same thing with a stream of ice coming in toward the poles. You would get, uh, it, would, it would develop a cold channel where a certain percentage of it would survive the journey. And as this goes along, the, a bigger percentage survives the journey because the cold channel is developed through the atmosphere, a cold tube, so to speak. Okay, the Earth's magnetic field dips in at the poles and super cold ice, I, I understand, can be easily statically charged and contain, has very different, different uh, properties. This is a girl uh, with her hairdo on a Van de Graaff generator. Uh, you've seen those before, you get them all charged up and the hair stands up. <coughs> um, <coughs> there. I've been told by uh, Carl Ball and some, a few others that extremely cold ice takes on unusual properties. Water molecules are bouncing around off each other. They generally have the positive side and the negative side sort of loosely attracted. A water molecule is shaped kind of like Mickey Mouse, you know, the big oxygen molecule and the two ears would be the two hydrogens, 105 degree angle between the two. The, because they're sharing an electron, the hydrogen end is slightly positive and the oxygen end is slightly negative. So the negative attracts another positive and water molecules are, they stick together, it's called it, uh, uh, cohesion I think is the, is the proper term for the, the surface tension it gets on it, but the molecules are kind of stuck together. Of course you can break them apart easy enough, you can do it, you know, bite it off, no problem. But they are stuck together. If you get it colder and colder and colder, it turns to ice. At about 32 degrees, depending on several other factors, but roughly 32 degrees, yeah, the water changes to a crystal, to ice. As it changes to a crystal, it, it takes on a very definite pattern and it actually swells up about 12%, which is why ice floats on water. And it's a good thing or else all the fish would die. If ice shrank, almost all materials, as they get colder, they get smaller, which makes them more dense. Water is one of the very few substances that as it, get, when it gets down to four degrees centigrade, which is about 37 degrees Fahrenheit, it's getting, it's, it's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. When you get to about 37 degrees, it starts to swell up. It swells up 12%. Very interesting and very useful because what would happen if the lakes froze and the ice went to the bottom. Then it would freeze again and go to the bottom and freeze again and pretty soon the lake would freeze from the bottom up, making it real tough on the fish, right? So God designed water so that it, when it gets to a certain temperature it swells 12 percent. Well, if you, what happens if you keep getting it colder and colder and colder and colder, past, way past the freezing point? I have, my understanding is that when you get ice down to negative um, 300 degrees, it starts to line up, the hydrogen molecules line up and the oxygen molecules line up, it's, it laminates. I've been told that extremely cold temperatures, you can take a piece of ice at say 350 below zero, hit it with a hammer and it behaves like lead. It won't break, it'll just flatten out. It becomes malleable, which is Gold, for instance, has many interesting qualities. It is malleable, which means you can hit it with a mallet and it'll flatten out. It'll just, it'll just keep spreading and spreading and spreading. You can beat gold extremely thin. And Carl Ball has a good book called Panorama of Creation um, where he says the firmament above the atmosphere was from the Hebrew word rekei, which means thin laminated sheets. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's interesting. 
that if the firmament was indeed a layer of ice, say six or ten inches thick, I don't know, enough to compress the atmosphere, and it would be suspended then by the Earth's magnetic field because it would be magnetic. It becomes metallic. People say, well, what held the canopy up there? Well, I don't know, but possibly the magnetic field of the Earth did. If in, in the days of Noah the magnetic field was stronger, which we know that it's losing strength now, so we assume it was stronger in the days of Noah, maybe 20 times stronger, you could suspend the Earth's magnetic field, or suspend the, uh, the canopy by the Meissner effect. Okay. As this ice, though, from the meteor comes in, it would tend to be deflected largely around the poles, as this uh, animation shows here. Ice meteor would break apart. Most of it would end up dumped on the poles because of the magnetic field of the Earth. That's going to tend to draw it mostly to the poles, not all of it, but some of it would you know, hit everywhere. But a larger percentage would hit at the poles. This would uh, end up with huge ice caps. Now, if we opened a hole in the ceiling here and started pouring in snow, it would start piling up. As the pile gets deeper and deeper and deeper, what happens to the edges? They start sliding out, right? I think that's where the ice uh, age came in. The ice was sliding out from the stuff being piled on the poles. The Bible tells us there was water under the crust of the earth and water above the firmament. So I'm just going to believe it until you can prove it wrong. This uh, article in Discover Magazine 97 tells about a scientist and his theory vindicated. This guy said he saw uh, chunks of ice hitting the atmosphere from one of the satellites. He could tell there were chunks of ice hitting the atmosphere. And they did a bunch of studies on this, and sure enough, they say, yep, it appears that giant chunks of ice as big as this house are hitting the atmosphere all the time. To, uh, now, it could be there are still fragments of ice flying around through space from some catastrophe 4,400 years ago, and we run into them once in a while. They don't seem to have any effect. Um, you know, now the atmosphere is about 100 miles thick, so they would certainly vaporize in, on, on the way through. Um, <clears throat> just interesting thought that uh, this guy did some studies and it appears, appears to be correct. So there used to be a canopy of water under the, over the earth and water under the crust of the earth. As that came shooting out to the surface, the earth was totally covered by water during the flood, some liquid, some solid. Now some have argued, well, how do you get sedimentation under the ice caps? Good question. There are layers of sediment under the ice caps. Sedimentation indicates water, sedimentary rock. Well, ice floats on water. If you had ice dumped on the poles, it would float up, and once everything gets readjusted, it'll come back down and land. Drain the water off from under it, falls right back down. That's uh, one theory, you know, of what caused the Ice Age. Okay, this is a kind of a strange view um, of the North Pole. Down in the bottom right, you can see Greenland. My daughter and I flew over it a couple months ago, coming back from Ireland. We had a big storm in the Atlantic, so the pilot said, folks, we're flying way north. We are over Greenland. And for an hour, I stared out the window at Greenland. It was incredible. I bet I saw 3,000 glaciers. They're just everywhere, you know, and it's so cool. I mean, what a bunch of wasted real estate. I mean, you could, there's nothing you could do with it up there, <laughs> unless you like ice cubes. Plenty of those. Well, on the far left, at a, on the, if this was a map, it'd be at about 10 o'clock or um, so, you will see the arrow pointing to those islands. Those are called the New Siberian Islands. That's part of Russia. It's actually on the far right is a Norway, Finland, Sweden, upside down to where you, where you normally look at it. And then there going counterclockwise is all of Russia through 15 time zones. Huge country. On the New Siberian Islands, they find frozen animals, frozen bobcat, frozen camels, frozen bison, mammoths. One man said there are so many frozen animals and bones of animals up there, you can hardly walk on the ground. And just as you walk, you're almost constantly on dead animals, dead carcasses. Well, what happened on the New Siberian Islands? All over this northern region, there are frozen things found. Um, when they drill through the ice, <clears throat> like this coring machine shows here, they drill through to test the thickness. This map from uh, of the South Pole says the greatest ice thickness ever measured, 14,000 feet, nearly almost three miles of solid ice. As in Greenland, the enormous overburden has depressed the continent. Antarctica, that would be isostatic rebound if it melted, it would lift up. 
Antarctica stores 7 million cubic miles of ice, most of the world's supply. If melted, it would raise the level of the oceans 250 feet. Let's see, how far are we above sea level right here? About 60? <laughs> We'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Most of Mississippi would be covered. I don't know what the elevation of Memphis is. I think Memphis might be 300 feet above sea level. So the water would come in almost to Memphis. That would be the Gulf of Mexico if the ice melted. Okay. Notice at the upper right-hand corner of this National Geographic map, it says the Dirty Diamond Mine dug here, 1962, yielded anthracite coal. Coal at the South Pole. Interesting. There are no trees at the South Pole. What happened? Admiral Byrd reported, when he got near the South Pole, he reported, he reported frozen palm leaves. Well, we have a hard time getting palm trees to grow here in Pensacola. You know, you get a cold freeze and it kills them. We're 30 degrees from the equator. You would never get palm trees to grow at the North or South Pole. And there are leaves there. So, all over Antarctica, we'll get into this in a minute, they find leaves, evidence of plants, even dinosaurs frozen and petrified uh, or petrified at the South Pole, near the South Pole. Two, two things could have happened. <coughs> Three things, actually. Number one, the South Pole might have been near the equator and it moved. Pangaea. You know, like they teach in the schools, the South Equator used to be up here, you know, in the South Pole, and Antarctica has moved around. I don't think so, but that is what some kids are taught. Or it could be there was a canopy of water over the Earth that protected it, and the whole Earth had tropical climate or near tropical climate everywhere. So palm trees grew there. Or it could be during the flood, the plants floated to the, and landed in that location. So anyway, regardless, they do find trees and evidence of trees at the South Pole. Here's an article report, scientists report finding fossils of dinosaurs in Antarctica's interior. <coughs> scientists have reported discovering the first set of dinosaur fossils ever to be found in the interior of Antarctica. The fossils are said to be the remains of a plant-eating dinosaur 25 to 30 feet long that lived about 200 million years ago. Mm -hmm. He needs to come to the seminar. The bones were spotted at a small section of exposed rock along the mountains alongside the mountain, which lies about 400 miles from the South Pole. What's a dinosaur doing down there? How about this article? The discovery of thousands of well-preserved leaves in Antarctica has sparked a debate among geologists over whether the polar region, rather than being blanketed by a massive sheet of ice for millions of years, enjoyed a near-temperate climate as recently as three million years ago. In January, Mr. Webb, with David Harwood, an assistant professor of geology at University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and a couple other guys, uh, found a deposit of leaves on the side of a cliff in a desolate stretch of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, which about 250 miles from the South Pole. The leaves, compressed by subsequent layers of ice, look like fossils, but unlike fossils which retain only, which leave only mineral traces of the original organism, the leaves retain their or original cellular structure. So these are simply pressed, preserved leaves near the South Pole. Hmm. At the North Pole, we have actually two North Poles. We have the magnetic North Pole where your compass points and your geographic North Pole where the Earth spins around. I think they're about 800 miles apart. I don't remember the number, but it's something like that, roughly 800 miles. Now, if you live in Alaska, of course, there's quite a difference. You have to adjust your compass. When you get in your car and you think you're driving north, well, you're driving magnetic north. The compass is only point to magnetic north. Here in Florida, it doesn't matter because they both line up pretty well. So if your compass says north, well, you're, you're still going north. Pretty close. <clears throat> Pilots, though, have to watch for this because the magnetic field of the Earth is a little irregular and they, they will have to be adjusted and they'll say, your, your compass is reading eight degrees off. You know, pilots are constantly kept aware of that, you know, how to adjust their compass to be actually going true north. Otherwise, it'd be real lost in a hurry. I uh, wouldn't land anywhere near where they're supposed to land. So I suspect the mammoths are up there chomping on their tropical flowers, and it began to snow. They'd never seen snow before. This was the fragments of ice coming in, in my theory. And so one of them said to the other one, he said, Herman, this is kind of peculiar weather we're having here. Let's, uh, let's get out of here. 
And he began to run around, you know, and the snow got deeper and deeper and deeper. And I know here we are in Florida, but how many of you have ever been in snow before? You ever been in snow so deep you could not fall over? You're just walking along and you stand there and you can't even fall down because you're stuck. Well, yeah, Wisconsin, you probably still got snow up there, don't you, in April. Um, yeah. <laughs> I remember in June, going up to northern Michigan, and we could still walk out on the lake. It's frozen in June. <laughs> Why does anybody live up there? I don't know. Um, but these mammoths were probably chomping on their tropical flowers and it began to snow. They got running around trying to find a place to escape this, you know, brand new disaster. They'd never seen anything like this before. And some of them ended up trapped in snowdrifts standing up. Snow buried them and suffocated them. You can suffocate in a hurry in a snowdrift. And uh, they froze in a few hours. The Beresovka mammoth, 1901, I believe it was found, was found frozen, standing up. The wolves had eaten the trunk and some of the head and one of the front legs, but the rest of it was very intact and was taken back to, uh, I believe they still have it in a big freezer in Russia someplace. Did you see this when you were in Russia, the Beresovka mammoth? Yeah, I have heard about it. You had not seen it, though. I think it's in Moscow, but I don't know. Uh, as the ice began scooting out toward the equator from this being dumped on the poles, it would carve out glaciers, or glaciers would carve out canyons. And all over the world you see mountains that are just obviously carved by glaciers, like the Matterhorn. Have you seen that one? They have a model in Disneyland. Uh, it's a Swiss, one of the Swiss Alps. The Matterhorn comes up and then goes back out and then goes up to a point. That's what makes it so hard to climb. <laughs> You've got to climb out to get going up again. So very difficult to climb the Matterhorn, they say. Um, this is because glaciers went around it. It was a mountain. Glaciers went around it and carved out that place like this on the Matterhorn. Get a, make a note for me to get a picture of the Matterhorn in here, would you, in six, uh, slide number 158, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, after 158. Um, and a lot of uh, obvious glacial effects are found all over the world. There was an ice age. The question is, when? Okay. I don't think it was millions of years ago. If you go to uh, Ohio, Kelly's Island is not too far from Toledo, Ohio. You can have to take a boat to get out to it. It's in Lake Erie. But you can go out to Kelly's Island and you can go all over Canada and see this feature right here. Glacial grooves, they're called. Scratches in the rock. If you took a great big huge rock the size of this house and dragged it across uh, another big rock, it would leave scratches. Kind of like you know, when you run your brake pads too low on your car, you know, it scratches the grooves in the rotors or in the, in the drum. And this is what you have. These glacial grooves are found all over the world, in the polar regions primarily. These happen to be from Kelly's Island, uh, Ohio. There, those are among many other features that tell us, yes, there was an ice age. These black lines on here show the uh, terminal moraine. Who remembers what a moraine is? Remember what a moraine is? We talk about that in here. As the ice is sliding along, it bulldozes in front of it piles of rocks. You might end up with a pile of rocks a half a mile high. Maybe not that high, but hundreds of feet high, okay? It'll pile up these rocks in front, and then the ice melts back. Well, the rocks aren't going to move. They stay there. And there are all over Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, uh, Minnesota. It's covered with uh, obvious effects of an ice age because there's these piles of rocks. Now, over the last, last 4,000 years, a lot of dirt has blown in, and now there's trees built. on It looks like just a mound, a, a hill. But if you dig down into it, it's full of big rocks. So the Earth is totally covered by water. The cold spots on the North and South Pole then, from this ice being dumped there, in my theory, would send out a cold wave. Like when you open the freezer, the cold air comes flowing out toward you. You can actually see the cold air flow out. The cold air moving off these polar ice caps would hit the warm air, causing it to rain. The canopy of water that used to protect them rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And all the sewers backed up and everybody drowned. So this canopy is now gone, <coughs> fell down at the time of the flood. Genesis 7, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the se second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. The flood water did not all come from the rain. 
I think the water for the flood came from three sources. Rain, 40 days and 40 nights. Be a good quiz question. Where did the water for the flood come from? Most of it came from inside the earth, right here. The fountains of the deep were broken up. It was subterranean water that simply came to the surface. If there was water underneath and all that water is put on top, the land then is going to sink down. And some pockets of water will be trapped. Some escape, some don't. And you end up with huge aquifers today. Oftentimes they'll drill down and you know, drill into underground lakes. Massive uh, amounts of water still trapped down in the ground. So the, water, the flood lasted a year. At least Noah was in the ark for a year. Probably the actual flood lasted six to ten months. We don't know. But uh, Noah didn't get out till a year after he got in. Here's the book of Jasher. How many have ever heard of the book of Jasher? Do we have that in the bookstore? Okay. This is uh, not part of Scripture, but it is very interesting reading. Okay, It's mentioned twice in the Bible. In uh, Joshua 10, verse 13, and in 2 Samuel 1, verse 18, it says, is not, this mentioned, is not this written in the book of Jasher? Well, where's Jasher? Okay, it's not in the Bible. Well, we have the book of Jasher if you want to buy it. I don't know the cost on it. You know, happen to know you're doing the catalog. It's uh, $10. $10, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, right there. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Daniel. I need guys like you around here. Uh, the, uh, here's what the book of Jasher says <coughs> in Jasher 6 11. And on that day the Lord caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently, and the lightnings flashed, and the thunder roared, and all the foundations in the earth were broken up. Interesting. They were having some bad weather. Jasher is kind of go kind of retells the whole Bible story, Old Testament. Uh, just different perspective. Apparently not inspired of God, but inspired somebody was inspired to write it. You know, not of God, but just inspired to say, well, it'd be, we ought to tell this story to the grandkids. And there's a lot of interesting things you can learn. Sort of like the uh, Archco volume. Anybody heard of the Archco volume? A R C H K O. Jan, you've got to read the Archco volume. Uh, I'll get it during the break. We'll take a break in a minute. I'll go get the Archco volume and show that to you. Matter of fact, we're on part four, so it's a good time to take a break right here. Take a break. When we come back, we'll uh, talk more about the uh, flood. All right, let's take up here a little bit. We mentioned during the break we would try to get the book of Jasher. Uh, just interesting reading, okay? If you like to read extra biblical history, the Archco volume, which I mentioned, is absolutely incredible. We don't sell it. We probably should. It is so good. This uh, German scholar, oh, I don't know, 150 years ago, I don't remember the story now. It's been a couple years since I read it, but he got to thinking, you know, if Jesus was such a famous person, surely there are some other records besides the Bible. He went back and searched ancient libraries all over the place and found interviews and court records about the life of Jesus that are not mentioned in Scripture. He tells all about how he discovered the records. A very fascinating story there. Uh, for instance, Jonathan was sent to interview the shepherds. This is the letter of Milker, priest of the synagogue at Bethlehem, Sanhedrin 88b by R. Joe, order number two. Jonathan, son of Heziel, questions the shepherds and others in Bethlehem in regard to the strange circumstances reported to have occurred there, and reports to this court. In obedience to your order, I met with two men who said they were shepherds and were watching their flocks near Bethlehem. They told me that while attending to their sheep, the night became cold and chilly, and some of them had made fires to warm themselves, and some of them laid down and were asleep, and they were awakened by those who were keeping watch with the questions, What does all this mean? Behold how light it is! that when they were aroused, it was as light as day. But they knew it was not daylight, for it was only the third watch. All at once the air seemed to be filled with human voices, saying, Glory, glory, glory to the Most High God, and happy art thou, Bethlehem, for God hath fulfilled his promise to the fathers, in thy chambers is born the King that shall rule in righteousness. Their shoutings would rise up in the heavens, and then sink down in mellow strains, and roll along at the foot of the mountains, and die away in the most soft and musical manner they had ever heard. Then it would begin again, high up in the heavens, in the very vaults of the sky, and descend in sweet and melodious strains, so that they could not refrain from shouting and weeping at the same time. It goes on page after page describing his interview with these shepherds and what they saw that night. Uh, that's just one of the chapters in here, that type of stuff, you know, extra biblical, very interesting. Pilate has a report here, um, the report of Caiaphas. Uh, just, uh, anyway, if you like that type of thing, we, uh, 
make a note. Let's check and see if we can get it through our bookstore and carry it here. In case I don't, I got enough stuff to carry on my table, but and it's not nothing to do with creation evolution. It's just fascinating reading. If somebody sees the tape and wants to get it, we'll try to have it in our bookstore. There's another extra biblical book called the Book of Enoch. Now there's a lot of serious questions about this one. Many people think that some uh, Catholic uh, Jesuit priests wrote this to justify purgatory and some other Catholic doctrines. The Bible does mention the book of Enoch. I forget where it mentions it, but as it says in the book of Enoch, you know, just like it says about the book of Jasher in, in uh, Joshua chapter 10, it mentions Enoch. So I don't know if I'd put a lot of stock in this one. Uh, there are some real wild stories in here uh, that obviously cannot possibly be true. You know, about people living to be 9,000 years old or something like that. Or people being 900 feet tall. I forget what it was. <laughs> or Robertson is 900 foot Jesus. Um, but the story may be indeed fabricated. There may be a real book of Enoch someplace, and this may or may not be it. I doubt that it is. But that we have one, and I'm not going to sell that. But if you want to take a look at the beginning, at the, uh, you know, where to get one for yourself, and uh, more extra biblical stuff. Okay, let's go back to the Hovind theory. So this ice meteor is coming in, breaks apart, fragments get dumped on the North and South Pole. That's why we have leaves there. That's why we have mammoths here, frozen, standing up, food in their stomach. Okay, <clears throat> the dump of ice on the Earth would cause the crust of the Earth to crack like an eggshell. This would release the fountains of the deep, and the ice would spread out shoving out, dumping it here on the poles, pushing out toward the equator. Eventually it runs out of gas and stops, uh, you know, glaciers will eventually stop, bulldozing ahead of it a pile of debris, uh, which is going to become then a moraine once it melts back. This caused the burial of the mammoths. It caused the earth to wobble for a few thousand years. Remember we talked about a spinning object that is hit by something? It'll wobble around. And then finally it'll stabilize. I suspect the Earth was more perpendicular to its orbit around the Sun as the Earth was spinning toward the east it goes. So if it got clobbered, the extra weight would cause the spinning Earth to wobble around. Today we're tilted over 23 and a half degrees, still spinning, and wobbling a little bit, not much today. Are the other planets more perpendicular in their... They're all different. Yeah, some are real perpendicular. Uh, Uranus is 98 degrees tilted. Mm -hmm. Spins like that as it goes around the sun. Uh, Venus spins backwards, real slow. I think it's 243 days, if I recall, for one day. day on Venus? Yeah, <laughs> real slow, something like that. Plus, their year is about the same. It maybe it's their day is longer than their year. I don't know. It's, it's you can look it up in an Earth Science book. Uh, that I don't recall about it rolling on its axis. I know it's tilted. I think it's 98 degrees tilted <laughs> over, if I recall. It's been 12 years since I taught this stuff. But uh, I know where to find the information <laughs> uh, as it goes around, like so. Pluto apparently is spinning backwards. Venus is spinning backwards. And Uranus is spinning sideways. Um, the other seven or other six are turning uh, all the same way. Okay, so the Earth wobbled around for a few thousand years. The cold air made the canopy that used to protect the Earth collapse, rain down, 40 days, 40 nights of rain, fountains of the deep squirting water up through the cracks, and everybody drowned. Earth was completely covered by water. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 7, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the Earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Now, I can't comprehend guys like Hugh Ross and ministries that su would support Hugh Ross, but uh, Hugh Ross says it was a local flood in the days of Noah. I'll just tell you, you can read that verse and say it was a local flood. He says, there's no reason for God to kill everything at the South Pole because there weren't any people there. Why kill the penguins? That's what Hugh Ross says. So Noah lived in the Mesopotamian area is what Hugh Ross says. Now how he knows that, I don't know. Mesopotamia is the region around the Black Sea or uh, Iran, Iraq um, today. Um, from Israel probably over to Iraq, Iran, maybe Afghanistan is called the Af uh, Mesopotamian region. We know the ark landed there. That doesn't mean he took off from there, does it? Let's say the f Noah was in the ark for a year. Let's just assume he was floating for at least six months. 
How far could you float in six months? Around the world? Twice, <laughs> probably, right? There's absolutely no telling where he built the ark. There's no telling where the Garden of Eden was. After they got off the ark, they probably saw some rivers and said, wow, that looks like the river Euphrates. So they named it Euphrates. Doesn't mean it's the same river. People came from Hampshire to America and called it New Hampshire. It is not the same place, okay? And York and New York, and there's a lot of places like that here that are named after what reminded somebody of something else. England yeah, England and New England, there you go, sure. So uh, it'd be silly to say, well, the Garden of Eden had to be over there in Baghdad because that's where the river Euphrates is. Oh, come on, think about it, okay? It does not have, that does not mean that's where it was. Garden of Eden's probably under 500 feet of mud someplace right now. Buried in solid rock underneath Pensacola, Florida. Who knows? You know, it could be anywhere. They landed right here. We have no idea where he took off from. But when the Bible says the earth, the water was above the mountains, all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Now, it doesn't mention mountains here. It says high hills. Later on, toward the end of the flood, it mentions mountains. Apparently, when God first made the earth, there weren't any giant mountains. The earth was smoother. Now, if you shrank the earth down to this size, 12 inches, all of the water in the oceans would be about that thick. I don't remember the number now, uh, but it would fill two tablespoons. Not even, it would not even fill two tablespoons of, of, of all the oceans. It'd just be a thin coating, a little thicker than the paint on this globe. The crust of the earth, say a 20-mile crust on an 8,000-mile earth, you can figure it up, is not much at all. Very, very thin crust compared to the earth at this uh, perspective. Okay. Pushing the mountains down and lay, raising the bottom of the oceans up evens things out, and there's enough water to cover the earth about a mile and a half deep. And a mile and a half on an 8,000 mile scale compared to a 12 inch globe works out to be barely the thickness of the paint. Certainly not even, probably about the thickness of a piece of paper, maybe, uh, on this globe. When they, on these globes, they put the mountains where you can feel the Rocky Mountains. Psh, yeah, right. If you shrank it down to this size, you couldn't find Mount Everest with a good magnifying glass. Okay? It just, it, you wouldn't notice it at all. It's nothing. Uh, so the high hills. Now, Hugh, Hugh Ross says it was just a local flood in Mesopotamia. Well, the reason he believes that is because he thinks the geologic column represents millions of years of Earth's history. So he has to protect the geologic column. Because if it was a, a worldwide flood, wouldn't that mess up all the geologic column? Well, yeah, so he don't want that. That's why he says it was a local flood in the days of Noah. And he's simply wrong. Hugh, you're wrong, okay? Get right with God on that topic. Okay. If the earth were reduced to this 12 inch globe like this one, all the waters in the oceans would not even fill one tablespoon. I knew I figured it out, the data here. Uh, today, the oceans average 12,000 feet deep. If the earth were smooth, the water would be 8,000 feet deep, one and a half miles everywhere. The average height of the land, and here we are, what, 60 feet above sea level, right where I think my house is maybe 60 or 70 or 80 feet above sea level in Pensacola. The average height, if you took all of the mountains, Rock, Him Himalaya Mountains, Rocky Mountains, all of them, if you averaged out all the land above sea level, it'd be 2,600 feet. Oceans average 12,000 feet deep. So if you draw that out on graph paper, 2,600 and 12,000, um, there's no comparison. There's plenty of water to flood the earth. Skeptics say, well, where do you get all the water to flood the world? Well, they're looking at it today thinking you have to cover Mount Everest. You don't have to cover Mount Everest. You have to push Mount Everest down and everything gets covered. When they climbed Mount Everest, 1953, Edmund Hillary, first one that we know of, at least to get to the top, when they got to the 26,000 foot level, now Mount Everest is 29,000 and 28 feet tall. At about 26,000 feet, they began to find petrified clams, seashells. I've got buckets of them here in our museum. These petrified clams are interesting. Uh, they're closed. How many have been to the beach in Pensacola? You can walk along the beach and find seashells by the zillions, right? You hardly ever find a matched pair, and you never find them closed. If it dies, it opens. 
very frequently you find the seashells have a hole drilled in them. How many have seen that before? There's a special animal that grabs these clams and with uh, his tongue, I believe, drills a hole, sucks the clam out involuntarily. And as soon as the clam dies, of course, uh, the shell opens up. He relaxes. You very rarely find a matched pair and you never find them closed if they're dead. And yet all over the world, petrified clams are found closed and petrified. What would that indicate? Buried alive or frozen. Probably buried alive. Underwater landslides. <laughs> a clam doesn't appear to be too bright. When they panic or something's happening strange in their environment, they clam up. That's where the word comes from. Okay? <laughs> they clam up. Shut, shut the door till everything goes away and then we'll see what happened. Okay? Well, if they all clam up and they get buried in a mudslide, they can't open. And they're going to petrify closed. I've got buckets of them here on the shelves. I will show you some later. In some places, they're 10 feet thick. A guy from Op, Alabama, up the road here, what, how far is Op? 100, 120 miles, maybe? 150? Whatever. He called me one day and said, Brother Hovind, do you need some more petrified clams for your museum? I said, yeah. Why? Do you have some? He said, yeah, they're four feet thick in my backyard. Every time he rototills for his garden, he brings up thousands of petrified clams. We were in Texas in Glen Rose, uh, seeing the footprints there, walking up and down the valleys and the hills around Glen Rose, Texas, and there are huge petrified clams closed in the middle of Texas near Dallas. Well, Dallas is a little ways from the beach, first of all, and these clams are huge. Of course, everything's bigger in Texas, you know how it goes. But they find these petrified clams literally all over the world. I have people give them to me. Also, we find fossilized eggs. Now, an egg is kind of fragile. To petrify an egg, you'd have to bury it quickly in nice, soft sediments that would later harden and preserve it. You can't be smashing these things around. And thousands of petrified eggs have been found. Genesis 7:11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. I think the earth cracked open because it got hit. Cracks spread around the world like an eggshell or seams on a baseball, and the water came shooting to the surface. Being hit would cause it to wobble. While it was wobbling for a few thousand years, slowly wobbling, seasons would be a little erratic, uh, and people would build temples to line up with whatever. And today the temples don't line up with the sun on summer solstice, the longest or shortest day of the year. Probably for several thousand. It's still wobbling some today. Well, if it, if it got hit at the time of the flood, 4,400 years ago, and it wobbled for, say, 2,000 years, slowly the wobble would stabilize, like a gyroscope will slowly kind of stabilize. What would the frequency of the wobble be? Don't know. Um, we heard last week when we talked about uh, uh, the Australian astronomer Dodwell and the studies he did on the temples and how the earth, he said it looks to him like something hit the earth 4,350 years ago. That was his, his take on it because of the wobble. Of course, the earth is massive. I think it weighs six sextillion tons. So the wobble would be, you know, you wouldn't notice it if you're on the earth. Each wavelength of the frequency of the earth. Yeah. <coughs> Probably may, uh, maybe a century or uh, scores of years, you know, it's, you would not notice it. You probably go through uh, colder winters for a while and then more stabilized you know, climate and yeah, frequency of the wobble, pick a number, you know, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. The Earth today still has cracks all over it. Mid Atlantic Ridge here um, is a giant crack in the crust of the Earth. San Andreas Fault, the Golden Fault, the Hayward Fault, I've been to many of them. I think when the earth broke open, though, the water in the inside would be warmer, maybe even hot. That water comes to the surface. Well, that's going to kill the diatoms. And I'll show you pictures of those in a minute. This is from Walt Brown's book. Now, he has a slightly different theory called the hydroplate theory. He does not uh, buy the ice meteor idea. He doesn't think that's correct, and he doesn't think there was a canopy before the flood. He and I talked for some time, a real nice guy. 
in uh, uh, when we were in, I was in Phoenix, Arizona at the airport. So I called him and said, hey, I got a three hour layover. Come on, I'll buy you lunch. So he came over and we had a wonderful time. And I love his book, In the Beginning, uh, one of the best you'll find on creation. Um, I would encourage everybody to read that, but he, he, he differs on this. Uh, he says, the fountains of the deep broke open. The water came shooting to the surface from these subterranean water chambers. As the water came shooting up, the layer under, you got a layer of rock, layer of water, another layer underneath, which is actually a layer of basalt. Basalt is uh, like lava hardens into a substance called basalt. It's coming from a melted rock. That basalt would lift up into, in the crack and the crack would get wider and the crust would actually slide off. Explaining why in some places of the world we find wrinkled mountains. <clears throat> These are up in British Columbia, Canada. If you take a piece of carpeting and start pushing it across the floor until you hit the wall and you keep pushing, the carpet wrinkles, right? We find mountains that are obviously compressed from the end. These weren't just lifted up, they're compressed. If the crust of the earth is sliding off of a rising mid-Atlantic ridge, it's sliding into what? I mean, it's not a vo vacuum out there. It has to eventually, something's crumbling. If, if the crust is moving anywhere, something else is either crushing or being subducted. Okay, that is, can't, it can't work any other way. Uh, in Yellowstone, of course, they have geysers shooting hot water up. I've been to all kinds of places where there's geysers in Calistoga, California, where they have Old Faithful. I don't know, probably 20 geysers are in the world named Old Faithful. Everybody has an Old Faithful. But um, are there any in Southern California, Daniel? Geysers or hot springs? Well, in 29. Hot springs. Yeah. That's right. They got one there at, at Murrieta. Murrieta Springs. That's right. Okay. Um, that was cool, wasn't it? At the top, it's really like 120 degrees if you want to get in that spa, and as it goes down, it gets a little cooler. <laughs> it's pretty slick. Oh, Chuck Smith did that. Anyway, these uh, hot water coming out of the ground would kill the diatoms. Now, diatoms are gorgeous under the microscope, but you, you can't see them without a microscope. Okay, real tiny critters that live in the water. Their body is made of glass, silica. They are so tiny, when they die, they fall to the bottom, and you don't even notice them. The estimates are it may take about a thousand years to get one inch of dead diatoms at the bottom of the ocean. They die, fall to the bottom, the kids die, fall to the bottom, the grandkids die and fall to the bottom. Um, and you build up a layer of dead diatoms. Hey Jeff, run out to building four. When you first walk in the door, there are two boxes of diatomaceous earth. Okay. Bring that in, would you? Uh, just grab one of them. One of them's open. You know what I'm talking about? It's a pretty good sized box. Uh, right the out there. Well, yeah, right? Five feet to the... From the just, uh, Veronica's cleaning the building out. Walk in the door, go straight ahead five feet, you'll see it. Okay. So grab one of those, would you? Diatomaceous earth, you can buy it at the hardware store, we'll bring a box of it in here, is used for all sorts of things. Uh, it's real cheap. It is so tiny, uh, you can spread this stuff around your house and bugs breathe it into their skin and kills them. It's a perfectly natural insecticide. I don't know of any bugs that can survive. There may be some, but I don't know of any that can survive diatomaceous earth. It's like extremely fine powder. When you feel this stuff, you just think it's like talcum powder or baby powder or something like that. You know, it's just real fine. It's actually these little tiny crystals if you could see them under the microscope. And they're, they're really gorgeous, all different shapes, you know, cubes and squares and diamonds and triangles. And diatomaceous earth is used for swimming pool filters. It's used for detergents uh, to clean your clothes for fertilizers, insulation, soundproofing, paper finishes. They will mix diatomaceous earth in with the uh, slurry of wood chips and makes the paper have a slicker surface. When they make paper, diatomaceous earth in there. Soundproofing, uh, oil dry, paint thickeners, the uh, uh, polishes, cat litter, you know the white crystals you put out for the kitty, that's diatomaceous earth. Uh, paint removers, and scores of other things. In Lompoc, California, so you, how far did you live from Lompoc? 35, minutes. 35, 40 minutes, yeah. Right on the San Andreas Fault. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to Florida, glad you're here. We get hurricanes here, but you can see them coming. The largest diatomaceous earth quarry in the world is in 
Lompoc, California. My understanding is they've been digging it there for quite a while. They think it may be 1,500 feet thick of this solid diatomaceous earth, which uh, Jeff will bring in here if he can find it. Um, you find one? Oh, look at that. Oh, hey, set that right up here. No, you don't need to bring both of them. We'll look at it here. Well, I'll bring the open one here. Yeah, we'll let the guys see what diatomaceous earth looks like. How much was this at the hardware store? I forget. Uh, pool time. This is used for pool filters, but diatomaceous earth. Get some out here. You can put it around your house uh, for kill the bugs. There, Nick, pass that around. Let everybody feel some of that. Very, very fine white powder. Now, if you can see it under a good microscope, hey, uh, Daniel, by Marlissa's desk, up on the shelf up high, is a big block of diatomaceous earth, extremely fragile. Bring that in here, would you? Just, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's like packed talcum powder. I normally don't put that on display because it, it'll crumble in a hurry. Uh, but we'll, we'll get that here. When I was in Lompoc, California, oh, several years ago, I toured this diatomaceous earth quarry. And they showed me how they dig this stuff out uh, with bulldozers. I mean, it's 1,500 feet thick. And it, it just, it's rock, but it's extremely soft rock, you know, much softer than chalk. You can just pick it up and just take it with your hand and just crush the rock, you know, to powder like this. Um, feels weird, doesn't it? Like real small. What happens is each of those crystals is so small, it absorbs a lot of water or liquid. They use this stuff for antacid. I believe that's what they use in antacid tablets, you know, because when you swallow it, it the powder breaks apart and each little bit absorbs just simple surface tension, attracts a whole bunch of acid from your stomach. By the way, antacids are the wrong way to treat stomach acid, but that gets, gets in a whole other subject in <laughs> Bible and health. We'll get into that some other time. When I was there, Lompoc, California is just right smack on top of the San Andreas Fault. I think it runs right through the middle of the town. Matter of fact, the San Andreas Fault does. At Diatomaceous Earth Quarry, Lompoc, California, a uh, remarkable discovery was made during mining operations in 1976. Workers at the Dye Calcite Division of Grefco Corporation uncovered the fossil skeleton of a baleen whale, along with trillions of fish fossils. The whale fossil is standing on end <coughs> in the quarry and is about 80 feet long. Now, some have argued, well, yeah, but the layers are tilted also. I understand. Okay, so actually the 80 feet of whale is not the problem. It's the thickness of the whale, about 8 feet. That's the problem to explain. Apparently the whole area has tilted up since then. Jessica, can you see if he needs some help or if he fell off and broke his leg? We don't want to uh, uh, lose Daniel or my uh, diatomaceous earth uh, sample that I have there. You can have that, Jan. That's it. What would you guess that weighs? Four pounds. Very, very little, isn't it? This is what I got when I was there. This is diatomaceous earth. See the different layers? Yeah, the box right there, Nick, if you want to study it. This is extremely lightweight and very, very fragile. It contains probably 20 fish skeletons. Can you see those? They find fish packed in this diatomaceous earth literally by the trillions. He said, we dig through fossils here all the time. He said, when I was out there, I talked to the foreman. He said, man, about six months ago or something on the night shift, they were digging away this slab of diatomaceous. Now, they dig it out in layers kind of carefully because it's, they grade it. Some's worth more than others, you know, depending how fine it is. Or some, sometimes there's impurities mixed with it. Obviously, this was deposited in a flood. But he said, we found the skeleton of a uh, pterodactyl. It had a 60-foot wingspan. That would have been the biggest in the world. But we didn't tell anybody because as soon as you say, oh, we found a fossil, the museums and the universities say, oh, stop, let's come dig it out. What do you mean stop? We've got 80 guys working here. Stop, as in, you know, let everybody stand around. <laughs> So they generally just don't even stop production. They, they don't dare tell anybody we found a fossil because it'll stop production. 
They're there to make money by digging out this diatomaceous earth. They're not there to dig out a fossil. But they dig through fossils like crazy all the time. Very carefully, Nick, if you'd pass that around, let everybody feel that thing. Very, very lightweight. And the more we handle it, the smaller it gets. <laughs> so we'll put it in the museum in a glass case and let everybody come look at it. But sorry, you can't, won't be able to touch that one normally. You could be, probably be the last ones to get to touch it because we got our glass shelves up today. Um, so the thickness of this whale becomes a problem. Let's assume it does take a thousand years to get an inch of diatoms. Wouldn't the whale rot before he was covered up? How could an 80 foot long whale, say 8 or 10 feet thick, get preserved in solid diatomaceous earth? Well, apparently the diatoms formed very quickly, the layers formed very quickly in order to preserve the whale. Wouldn't it preserve him otherwise, would it? It's that block of stuff you're holding in your hand there. And it's, it's all rubbing off on you, and every, that's the diatomaceous earth, okay? I mean, they did get out by the train load. Unbelievable amounts of that stuff. I mean, massive bulldozers come in there. Yeah, worse than chalk. It's actually finer than chalk. It feels, it gets down in your pores. Uh, <laughs> very weird stuff. But there's probably, we could count them, but it'd be tough to count, I guess, probably 20 fish fossils. Daniel's going to count them. Over 20, yeah. Just in probably one square foot. And this 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 way for uh, several miles. Literally trillions of fish perished, okay? In Dover, England, <clears throat> the cliffs are chalk. Matter of fact, in Latin, the word Cretia means chalk. So the Cretaceous age that the kids learn in their geologic column was named after the layer of chalk found in England and over in France. Cretaceous for Cretia means chalk. There's so much chalk, the evolutionists call this the Cretaceous age, the age of chalk. They have solid chalk, just like you write on the chalkboard with, 300 feet thick. You can break up your yard and write on the chalkboard. Well, chalk is obviously made from marine organisms. So how do you get so much, how many marine organisms would have to die to make a 300 foot thick layer of chalk? It's called a calcite. The chalk cliffs of Dover, made of calcite. Genesis 7, the Bible says, The waters prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. See, the waters prevailed. They had the power over the earth there for a while. I think during the first few months of the flood, the dead animals would settle out. The hot water coming out along these cracks is going to kill the diatoms by the zillions. If you poured a gallon of boiling water into an aquarium, what would happen to the fishies? Well, within a certain effective radius, it's going to kill them, right? If they happen to be far enough away, it won't hurt them. But if they're too close to where the boiling water contacts, it'll, the temperature rises too quick and it kills them. I think the diatoms all died within several miles of the San Andreas Fault. And instead of slowly accumulating at the bottom, they all died at the same time. And you got a thousand foot thick layer of dead diatoms in a, in a few weeks, preserving trillions of fish and all sorts of other things too found there. These dead animals settle out. The swirling waters, though, deposit piles. Uh, you can get uh, water swirling in a pond, and uh, it's really neat the way it separates things on the bottom of the pond. You get gravels to the middle, and then sands. It just it makes concentric rings. Coal would form then, and fossil graveyards over the next few hundred years. Moving water automatically sorts particles based upon their density, based upon a lot of different things, actually. Have you seen those things, the two pieces of glass with different color sand inside? You flip it over, and it, you got those, right? It's your place, right? Makes all sorts of pretty patterns. Jessica, put on the list to, uh, let's get three or four of those for the museum for the kids to play with, small ones. You can buy those at the mall. Where? No, two pieces of glass with sand and water in between, different color sand. You flip it over, and when it comes down, it makes these different patterns. It automatically separates. Why does it do that? Well, that's just a phenomena of particles falling through water. The denser and lighter are sorted. 
So some people look at the geologic column of the Earth and say, well, this took millions of years for each layer. No, this took one flood for all of the layers. It's a matter of looking at it from God's perspective. Underwater landslides can happen. They're called a turbidity current. They do enormous amounts of damage. Scientists are really shocked at how far water mud can slide underwater. There was an underwater landslide uh, that cut the transatlantic cable. The mudslide was going 70 miles an hour underwater. Fastest sub, probably 30, 35 miles an hour. 70 miles an hour. Cut off the transatlantic cable. Okay, swirling waters are going to deposit animals in fossil graveyards. And we'll quit here in a second. The uh, animals, as they float around for a year or six months, would rot. You'd get huge eddies of swirling, rotting carcasses, tr uh, trees, uh, grass, mixture of everything in this muddy water in the flood. Now, it wouldn't be all turbulent all the time, every square inch of the earth, okay? There'd be, I'm sure there'd be, like, there'd probably storms going on right now on the earth. It's not affecting us, is it? There's probably typhoons and hurricanes hitting someplace right now. It doesn't affect us. And when one hits us, it doesn't affect the folks in China. So people say, well, if, you're, if the flood was so turbulent, how did Noah survive? He'd break the boat apart. Well, duh, just because it's turbulent one place doesn't mean it's turbulent every place, okay? Um, as these animals rot, they're going to become what's called disarticulated. The bones are going to come loose from each other. And they're going to end up buried in tangled up messes. Notice the dinosaur backbone here. There's no legs, no ribs, no head, just the backbone. And importantly, no teeth marks. Look at the one above the guy's head here. You see the backbone is bent backwards. These animals were rotting in water before they were buried. If they were being torn apart by scavengers, you would have teeth marks on the bones. You don't. And uh, we'll take that up uh, next class about uh, continuing on the Hovind theory. If uh, you can hang on that long or fast forward the tape, if you're watching the tape, we'll get there next time. Thank you so much.